Uh, it's my privilege to welcome our speaker tonight, and I'm going to be brief, but I just wanted to give you a little sense of the ingredients for what I think is an amazingly impressive leader who has taken uh, tremendous personal and business risks in the service of what he thought was right and just. Uh, Bill Browder is a Midwesterner, originally a Chicagoan, a White Sox fan. Um, he is the grandson of a leader of the American Communist Party and then worked at BCG and Solomon Brothers as a young Stanford MBA. So put those three things together and you have to perhaps scratch your head a little bit and, and know that there's an amazing story behind all of that. Uh, then, over the 20-year period, roughly following 1996, Bill established one of the first major investment funds in Eastern Europe, saw it rise 800% in value, and come back down a little bit at times. Um, he was one of Putin's biggest advocates among the expatriate community, but then was blacklisted and banned from re-entering Russia, uh, has called London home ever since had his Moscow offices raided by 50, 50 police officers from the Interior Ministry of Russia, and then struggled to help his Russian lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who was imprisoned, tortured, and ultimately died or was murdered for challenging the authorities and the oligarchs in Russia. Um, following that, he lobbied hard and ultimately successfully for what came to be known as the Sergei Magnitsky Act here in the United States and is now pushing for a global version of that act to expand the authority for the United States and other countries to prosecute people for human rights violations outside their own borders. Uh, as many of you know, he wrote a chilling tale about these relatively quiet and uneventful two decades following 1996, and that book, Red Notice, is a powerful tale, I think, of public leadership and personal values. And so it's my honor tonight to welcome Bill Browder, founder and CEO of Hermitage Capital Management, as this year's first speaker in the Stanton Distinguished Leaders Series. Bill. Well, that was such a great introduction. I'm not even sure um, what I was, I, I was, you covered all my points. Um, <clears throat> so when you hear my um, American accent and you hear this story about how I um, got into all this trouble in Russia, um, the obvious question is, how, how, did, <clears throat> how, did, how did you, as an, how, did, how did this American guy end up in such a mess? And so I'd like to um, take you back 100 years um, to my grandfather, um, Earl Browder. My grandfather was uh, born in Wichita, Kansas, and he became a labor union organizer in the 1920s. And he was so good at organizing the labor union in Wichita, they invited him to Kansas City. And he was so good in Kansas City, they invited him to New York City. And in New York City, um, there were a bunch of communists running around. And the communists approached him and they said, if you like labor unionism, you're going to love communism. Why don't you come to Moscow and check it out? And so uh, my grandfather Earl went to Moscow, and uh, he did what every uh, red-blooded young American man does when he gets to Moscow. He found a Russian girl um, who became my grandmother. Um, my uh, father was born in Moscow. And then five years later... Um, he was tapped on the shoulder, and they said, why don't you go back to America and lead the Communist Party? So Earl goes back with my father and my grandmother and, and a couple brothers, and um, he leads the Communist Party of America. He runs for president in 1936 and 1940 against Franklin Roosevelt, was imprisoned in 1941 by Roosevelt, pardoned in 42. Um, he was then uh, kicked out of the Communist Party in 1945 for being too much of a capitalist. Um, and then he was persecuted uh, vigorously during the 1950s in the McCarthy era for being a communist. So this is my family legacy. Um, <clears throat> I was born in 1964, I'm 52 years old. Um, but when I was going through my teenage rebellion, um, I said to myself, um, what's the best way that I could upset my family? And um, uh, the first thing I did was I grew my hair long. And um, it, it actually didn't grow long. It grew out into an afro. Um, 
and that didn't upset my family. It only, it, the only thing it did was it, it caused my father to blame my, uh, he, he blames my uh, baldness on my afro. <laughs> I followed the Grateful Dead um, for, for some months, um, and again, that didn't upset my um, family. But then I came up with the perfect, the perfect thing, which was to put on a suit and tie and become a capitalist. There was nothing that upset my family more than that. So I became a capitalist. Um, I, I ended up at Stanford Business School um, in 1987. Um, I went through business school, and I graduated business school in 1989, <clears throat> which was a very auspicious year. That was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And like many of you here who are in business school and maybe even undergraduates, um, I was struggling at the time to try to figure out what it is, what it is that I wanted to do after I finished, career-wise. And I went to a lot of on-campus interviews and brown bag lunches and dinners and receptions and so on, and none of the things that I went to um, uh, resonated with me. Um, and then one, this one day, I, I had this epiphany, which is that um, the Berlin Wall has come down. And, and I said to myself, my grandfather was the biggest communist in America. The Berlin Wall has just come down. I'm going to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And so that's what I set out to do. Um, my very first job um, in, um, uh, was I, I got a job at the Boston Consulting Group in London. Um, the reason I chose the Boston Consulting Group was they had, um, I, I went to them and I said, I wanted to work in Eastern Europe. And they said, that's great. If we ever have anything in Eastern Europe, you'll be our guy. So I took the job. Um, and then one day, they, they, uh, the managing partner knocked on my door and said, you were the guy who wanted to work in Eastern Europe, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, great. We have an assignment for you. And, uh, and so they sent me out to this um, bus factory, this failing bus factory on the uh, Polish-Ukrainian border. And... Um, and they couldn't afford, it, 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 the World Bank was the one paying the fees, and it was very, very low fees for BCG, and they couldn't afford to send out a proper team of consultants, and so they sent me out by myself as a first-year um, consultant. <laughs> so I get out, and, and I know nothing about buses, I know nothing about business, I know nothing about anything. I'm just one year out of business school with no experience in life whatsoever. Um, and so I show up in this little town with this failing bus factory, and my mandate was to try to figure out what to do about it. And... Um, and really, there was the, the, the reason it was failing was that the, um, the state bus company, the, the, the company that sends the buses around the, the country, um, they stopped buying the buses, and they, they made up something like 90 or 95 percent of the sales of this bus factory. And so basically, they lost 95 percent of their customers. And um, there was really only one thing to do, which was to fire 95 percent of the staff, which wasn't a very pleasant assignment. Um, but as I was walking around sort of counting up people to fire in different divisions, I had this um, translator who was with me the whole time. And um, uh, one day I noticed, the, uh, in his, he carried around a newspaper every morning that he'd pick up, and one day I noticed on his newspaper there were a bunch of financial figures on the front page. And, and, um, and I said, what, what, what's, what are those financial figures on the front page of your newspaper? And he very proudly said, ah, these are Poland's first privatizations. I said, oh, that's interesting. Could you explain them to me? And so we sat down at a, at a conference room table. He laid out the newspaper. <clears throat> and I said, what does that number say? And he said, that's the number of shares outstanding of the company. And, what, and I said, what's that number? And he said, that's the share price. Um, and then I said, uh, what's that number below? And, and he said, uh, that's last year's earnings. And I said, no, no, re read it again. He said, and he said, last year's earnings. And... Um, and the, the, the market cap of the company, the share price times the, the um, number of shares, was um, $80 million. And um, was, uh, the last year's earnings were $160 million. So this was a company that the Polish government was privatizing at one half of one year's earnings. <laughs> <clears throat> so you, you don't have to be an MBA to, to understand that that's a, like a really good deal. And... and <clears throat> And I thought to myself, you know, this, this is exactly what I went to business school for, was to, like, find this type of opportunity and then act on it. And, and um, so I, I sort of really got excited about it, and I thought, what, what should I do about it? And I, and I finally decided, um, like, two days later, I, I'm going to go all in on Polish privatizations. And so I took my entire life savings, which was $2,000 at the time. <clears throat> I converted it to Polish Zloty, and I, um, I went in and um, bought these shares. And um, 
uh, my assignment ended in Poland. Um, we um, recommended firing a bunch of people. They didn't. But um, about a year later, <laughs> uh, at about a year later, um, my portfolio had gone up ten times. My twenty thousand dollar investment had turned. I mean, my two thousand dollar investment had turned into twenty thousand dollars. Now, I don't know how many of you in this room have um, had a ten uh, an investment go up ten times in your portfolio. Um, if you, if you have, you would know that it releases a certain chemical in your stomach, and you want to repeat that experience as much as you possibly can. And so after this, this great um, situation, I, I, fi I finally found my true calling in life, which was I was going to invest in the privatizations of Eastern Europe. So we fast forward a couple of years, and I'm no longer at BCG. I get a job at Solomon Brothers as an investment banker. I couldn't quite figure out how to become an investor yet, but I got a job as an investment banker at Solomon Brothers. And um, I show up at Solomon Brothers um, uh, on the Eastern European team, and my very first assignment was to advise the Murmansk trawler fleet, a fishing fleet located 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle, on their privatization. And again, it was like this BCG thing where the client, the trawler fleet, was paying so little money that nobody else wanted to do it, and so I was... Um, I was the um, most junior person at the firm, and so they sent me up to do this assignment. So I fly up to Murmansk, and um, the general director of the fishing fleet comes and meets me at the airport. And um, uh, before we go to the hotel to drop my stuff off, he takes me to the docks so I can see one of their boats. <clears throat> and and we, we get out of his car, and I look at one of these ships, and it's huge. It's like 300 feet long. It's on multiple levels. Um, and he starts explaining to me that at the top level they catch the fish and at the next level they separate the fish from all the other stuff that comes in and then they put it down to the next level and they, they can the fish and so on and so forth. And effectively these were ocean going fishing factories. And um, I asked him how much does one of these things cost? And he said these are, um, they cost $20 million new. And I said how many of them do you have? And he said we have about 100. So that's $2 billion worth of ships. And I said, what's the age of the fleet? And he said, the average ship is seven years old. So I do my math, and I figure, seven years old, maybe the, sh the fleet is half depreciated, so it's a billion dollars worth of ships. <clears throat> the reason that I had been hired was to advise the, the fishing fleet management on whether to exercise their right under the privatization program um, to purchase 51% for $2.5 million. So let's just repeat the math. There's a billion dollars worth of ships, and they have the right, legitimately, under the privatization program to purchase 51% for $2.5 million. That's what I was supposed to be advising them on. <laughs> so, of course, the advice is do it. Um, but for me, that chemical in my stomach started to percolate through my body, and I thought to myself, what am I doing advising these people on this stuff? I want to be investing in, in this stuff. And so instead of going back to London... I got on an airplane and went to Moscow to see whether this was some type of special anomaly in the fishing industry or whether this was more widespread. And so I, um, <clears throat> I get to Moscow, and I don't speak a word of Russian. Um, I don't know a single person in Russia other than these fishing people. Um, and uh, I get at the airport there, and they're selling an English-language yellow page directory at the kiosk at the airport. And so I figure that's the best way to start out. And so I buy a copy of this yellow page directory, I um, go to my hotel, and the next morning I start cold calling people to ask them if they'd have meetings with me to discuss privatization. And uh, I set up about 40 meetings over the course of a week, and um, by the end of the week, I had figured out that um, during that time, um, this was now 1992, um, Ru the Russian privatization program was the, the most compelling investment opportunity that um, had ever existed and probably would ever exist in the history of financial markets. What they were doing was um, they had something called voucher privatization. And voucher privatization <clears throat> was they, they gave each citizen of the country a voucher. And at the time, there was about 150 million citizens, so 150 million vouchers. And these vouchers were these uh, freely exchangeable instruments. Anyone could buy them and sell them. And they had a market price of about $20. So $20 times 150 million vouchers gets you to $3 billion worth of vouchers. And these $3 billion worth of vouchers were exchangeable for 30% of all the share capital of all Russian companies, which meant that the market capitalization of Russia at the time was $10 billion. 
This is a country with a third of the world's natural gas, 10% of the world's oil, 10% of the world's aluminum, 10% of the world's steel, fertilizer, you name it, they had it. The entire thing, the entire country, $10 billion. Now, I mean, that, that, that was the price of one mid-sized oil company in America. This is the entire country of Russia. And so I got extremely enthusiastic. I said to myself, they're just basically giving everything away for free. I go back to Solomon Brothers. I, I run up the escalators in, at uh, <coughs> Buckingham Palace Road, and I tell my colleagues, I say, we, we should stop whatever we're doing, and we should be investing in Russia. Now, imagine some guy coming to you and saying that. Um, they looked at me and said, what? You invest in Russia? What are you talking about, Bill? And I tried to explain it to them, but <clears throat> just mentioning the word Russia was enough to turn, turn everybody off. And I had no sort of internal political skills um, to uh, you know, figure out how to, how to get a decision made. And so I just figured if one person said no, I'd go to the second person. So I started working my way around the um, uh, company. And the more people I told about Russia, the more my credibility sank. Um, and uh, it sank to such, a, to such a level that all the um, young associates um, who I used to hang out with and have lunches and drinks with stopped inviting me out for lunch and drinks. And, um, uh, and so no, nobody wanted to invest in Russia. My credibility was, was shot. And most importantly, I wasn't making any money for the firm because there, was, there wasn't a whole lot of, of fee income in Russia. And I was on the verge of being fired and being, getting quite distressed about the whole thing because I knew that there was this gold mine just there and nobody understood it except for me. And uh, I was getting more and more upset. And then one day my phone rang and it was a very senior partner in the New York office of Solomon Brothers saying, Bill, I hear that you're having some type of uh, career problems, but you might have something interesting to say about Russia. Can you come to New York? So I uh, put together, I said, yes, I'll be there on Friday. I put together a very detailed PowerPoint presentation on how compelling this investment opportunity was. I get on the plane, I go to New York, I sit down in this room with this partner, and I start to take him through my presentation. And I start turning over the slides, one after another after another, and, um, and he's a strange guy, this partner. He, he didn't do any of the normal stuff that people do in presentations. He didn't do any nodding or uh-huh or any, any type of feedback that would give you the sense that, that um, you're communicating with the person. <laughs> <coughs> So I, I, was, I, was, I was doing all this um, talking and, and, and then like sort of 18 minutes into my presentation, he just got up and left the room. <laughs> and I was just mortified. I thought to myself, um, uh, you know, this was a chance to save my career to get involved in Russia. I, I thought I had done it. I, th I, I thought I had put together a really compelling presentation. And no, I hadn't. And I was trying to figure out how to how to salvage the meeting when he came back, and, and um, I was coming, going through my mind of all the different things I could say, and the guy was gone for 10 minutes, and then it turned into 20 minutes, and then 30 minutes, and 40 minutes, and I was getting more and more agitated trying to figure out what I was going to say, and like 52 minutes later, the guy comes back, and I was about to blurt out something to, to try to put this meeting back on track, but before I had a chance to say anything, he sits down and said, you know, what you showed me was the most compelling thing I've ever seen in my investment career. I've just gone to the risk management committee of Solomon Brothers and I got you $25 million to invest. <clears throat> and I was like, wow. <laughs> All the, the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. The black cloud had, had, had blown away. And um, I invested that $25 million. And uh, seven months later, um, in, in the summer of 1994, um, the Economist magazine wrote an article um, entitled Sale of the Century, in which they just went through the same math that I shared with you about the voucher privatization program. And because of that article, um, about 25 new investors showed up to a tiny little illiquid market of, of Russian stocks. And those 25 investors jammed up the market 500% in, a, in, in, a, in a, like a month. And so my $25 million turned into $125 million. And this, by the way, was back in the time when $100 million was real money. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all of the guys who had been avoiding me for lunches and drinks <laughs> were hanging around my desk in the morning trying to get tips on how to make five times their money in, in Russia. And then very interestingly, the uh, senior salespeople at Solomon Brothers, the guys who covered the Soros account and the um, Steinhardt account and the Julian Robertson account and all these famous investors, they started coming up to me and saying, Bill, 
I know you're real busy, but is there any chance you could spare a little bit of time to meet with uh, George Soros to explain to him about what's going on in Russia? He'd, he'd really be very grateful. You know, <laughs> you know, Sir John Templeton heard about you and, and really would be so impressed if you could just spend a little time with him. And so I, uh, I, I was 29 years old. I said, yeah, sure. I'll. So I, I, I got on the plane and I did a, a world tour of the most famous investors in the world. I, I sit down, and they're much smarter than the guys at Solomon Brothers were, were and, and I, I show them this presentation, and, and, and every single unanimous immediate reaction is, that's amazing, um, can I give you some money to manage? So I say, I don't know, because we're just doing this for our own account. <clears throat> we're not doing this for anybody else. Let me go back to the bosses and see what they have to say. So I go back to the, to the bosses, and I say, um, uh, can we manage money for um, other people, because uh, George Soros and Julian Robertson would like that, and uh, <laughs> and and the um, the head of the trading floor said, "Bill, that's a great idea. Let's form a task force to study it." So I say, "Okay." So we go. The first task force meeting is the following Monday. I show up in this room. It's a conference room, reasonably small, and in shuffles forty-five people. Forty of forty of them I've never seen in my entire life. There was. Uh, there was the vice chairman, senior managing directors, managing directors, senior vice presidents, vice presidents, and me. I was, I was the lowest person in the, in the room by far. So the meeting gets, uh, gets underway, um, and immediately a fight breaks out um, as to who's gonna, which, which, which part of Solomon Brothers was going to get the economic credit for the business. Was it going to be the investment bank where I'd come from, or the emerging markets group, or asset management, or whatever? And um, one thing that some of you probably know about investment bankers is they're extremely good about arguing um, to get money that they don't deserve. <laughs> and these guys were just making these unbelievably great and compelling arguments about why they deserve to, to, um, to get this money that was going to come from this future business. And, and I was just was like watching a game of multifaceted tennis, just back and forth and back and forth. And I, I had no idea who was going to win this argument. <clears throat> but I knew for sure one person who wasn't going to get any economic credit for this business, and that was going to be me. And so I got very upset, and I spent three nights unable to sleep, and I finally like, just couldn't take it anymore, and so I go in the fourth day, and I resign from Solomon Brothers to set up my own business to invest in Russia. And um, I, one of those guys who I'd met, a guy named Edmund Safra, who is no longer alive, but he owned uh, Republic National Bank of New York, which was a very large private bank, um, he agreed to give me $25 million dollars um, to, to uh, be seed investor in my business. I moved to Moscow. I started investing in April of 1996. And in the first 18 months of my fund's operation, we went up 865%. Um, we went from $25 million of assets under management to more than a billion dollars. Um, I was featured uh, in the New York Times. Uh, I was featured in the Financial Times and Time Magazine. I was the best performing fund management a firm in the world in 1997. Um, I, my clients were sending their private jets to, um, uh, to take me to their yachts to celebrate my financial genius. <laughs> and I was 31 years old. <laughs> now, any of these things would be great accomplishments in their own right. Um, but to be a 31-year-old and combine it with the uh, uh, best-performing fund manager in the world, New York Times, et cetera, um, that's the biggest sell signal there ever was. Um, but I was 31 years old, and so I didn't see that, and so I um, didn't sell. Um, uh, I thought it was all going to keep on growing to the sky. And um, <clears throat> uh, th this was 1998 at this point, and if you, uh, if you remember back to 1998, um, the Asian currency started to de devalue, um, and then that eventually led to the Russian currency starting to devalue. And in August of 1998, the um, uh, Russians defaulted on their debt, devalued their currency by 75%, and my billion dollars portfolio went down 90%. I lost $900 million at the age of 31. <laughs> so all the journalists that had been profiling me on the way up were profiling me on the way down. Um, but more, more uh, uh, unpleasant than that was that I had, I had attracted all these people to invest in Russia. I had gone out and told everyone, you should come invest with me, it's going to be great. And all these people lost a lot of money. And so I was really I, I, ashamed of myself and ashamed of the mess that I brought them into. And so I asked, uh, I, I said to myself, There's, 
I'm, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to fight my way out of this hole if it's the last thing I ever do because I don't want to have the responsibility of having lost people all this money. So everyone else I knew left Russia. I stayed. Um, and I thought that my, to get back to par wasn't going to be nearly as hard as, I, as, as a lot of people thought because most of the companies I invested in were oil companies. The oil price was steady or even rising at the time. And the costs of the company were all in rubles that had just gone down by 75%. And so if your revenues are the same in dollars and your costs are down 75%, um, um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, uh, that should generate a lot of profits. Well, um, it should have, except for the oligarchs who ran these companies. Um, uh, they all came up with a very logical conclusion, which was the only reason that they had ever behaved themselves up until this point was because they thought Wall Street was going to give them, give them free money. But um, Wall Street was closed for business after the devaluation and default. Um, and uh, so there was no incentive to behave because Wall Street was closed. And in Russia, there's never been any disincentive to misbehaving. And so as, as these oligarchs were very logical people, they decided to just steal everything. So they embarked on an orgy of stealing, which has been unprecedented in the history of business. They did asset stripping, transfer pricing, embezzlements, dilutions, everything you could think of. And there I was sitting with my last 10 cents on the dollar, and it was going to be stolen from me. And so not as an investment strategy, but as a matter of, of financial survival, I decided to um, try to fight the stealing that was going on in Russia. And the most famous case that I was involved in involved Gazprom, a company you've all heard of. <clears throat> Gazprom was trading at a 99.7% discount to BP and Exxon per barrel of reserves in 1999. Why was it trading so cheaply? Because everybody assumed that every last cubic meter of gas was stolen out of the company. So I decided to do something which had never been done before, which was a stealing analysis of Gazprom. Um, how do you do a stealing analysis of a Russian company? You can't go and ask the um, management uh, excuse me, sir, can you tell me how much you're stealing? Um, uh, because obviously that, <laughs> they're not going to tell you. Um, and, and you couldn't go to the investment banks who covered the company and ask them how much stealing was going on because investment banks had their noses so firmly up the backside of the management of these companies that, that uh, there's no way that was going to happen. So, but, I, but I had learned something very clever when I was at the Boston Consulting Group, which is um, that if you don't know the answer to a question, you go out and find 20 or 30 people that do, and you interview them, and you write down the answer, and then you come up with your answer. That's what the consultants do. <laughs> uh, so I said, I'm going to find 20 or 30 people who know the answer to the question of how much stealing is going on in gas problems. So I made a list of all the people I thought might know, the competitors, customers, suppliers, ex-employees, etc. And I asked everybody to lunch and dinner and tea and coffee, and a lot of people said yes, and so I ended up with this series of meetings. And my very first meeting, I discovered, so I, asked, I sat to sit down and I asked the guy, could you tell me about the stealing of Gazprom? And I discovered the most shocking and interesting uh, cultural anomaly uh, at the comp at, at, in Russia, <clears throat> which is that during the um, uh, communist era, the richest person was maybe six times richer than the poorest person in Russia. They might have had a, like a dacha and a bigger apartment and a driver. Um, but that was it. Uh, by 1999, the richest person in Russia had become 250,000 times richer than the poorest person in Russia over a 10-year period. And that disparity of wealth completely and absolutely poisoned the psychology of the whole country. And so because of that, these people were so angry and so upset, they started to spill their guts in these meetings. And in the first meeting, I was writing all these notes down, writing it all down, and writing it all down and filling up a, fill, page after page after page of these unbelievable stories, the second meeting the same, third meeting, etc. we filled up two full notebooks with these just shockingly unbelievable stories of stealing a gas prom. And the only problem with that is that we didn't really know what we could do with it because we had no idea if it was true. Um, so people can say anything, and, and in Russia people do lie, and they lie a lot, and they exaggerate, and there's sour grapes and je jealousy and all sorts of stuff. So we had all these great collection of anecdotes, but we didn't know what we could do with it. And, and, and so I was sort of frustrated with this and not knowing what to do. And then about three weeks after we completed our last interview, we had this amazing break. My head of research, a guy named Vadim, was, was driving along <clears throat> the boulevard ring in Moscow 
the Boulevard Ring, um, when it when it hits the main thoroughfare of, of Moscow called uh, Tverskaya, it it creates this traffic jam, um, which can last anywhere from sort of 15 minutes to an hour, depending on on the time of day. And so, as a result of this traffic jam, it, it, this outdoor market among the the motorists has, has sort of sprung up, and all these street urchins sell everything from cigarettes to lighters to lingerie to newspapers to pirated DVDs and all sorts of stuff. And so he was sitting in the traffic traffic jam and, and some kid knocks on his um, window and he rolls it down and and, uh, and he said, what do you have? And the kid said, I'm selling um, databases. And uh, he said, what do you mean? And so the kid has this down parka, he opens it up and it has all these um, uh, transparent folders with these disks in it. And he said, what's that one? And he said, that's the Moscow Registration Chamber database. And this is the um, something we've been looking for. Um, <laughs> and um, this this proves the beneficial ownership of all Moscow-based companies. And, and he said, how much is it? And he said, uh, five bucks. <laughs> Somebody had research, buys it for five bucks. He, um, he then comes back to the office and, and he says, you know, you won't believe this. This kid claims he was selling the Moscow Registration Chamber database for five bucks. He said, let's, let, I'm sure I got ripped off, but let's just check it out. And this was long before the days of, of uh, computer viruses. So we took this random database we bought, put it into the computer. And sure enough, it was the Moscow Registration Chamber database with all bells and whistles. And the most important thing was on the front of the disk, they have a phone number you could call uh, for other databases. And it, and it turns out that we actually did get ripped off because the other databases were only a buck. Um, <laughs> but we bought all the databases. We then compared them with all the notes that we had taken with all these um, interviews. And we were able to conclude the most astounding economic um, discovery that, that I've ever made in my life, which is that, that between 1996 and 1999, nine members of, of, of the management of Gazprom had stolen oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait out of the company. This, as you remember, that we, we fought a war over exactly the same size oil re gas reserves in Kuwait, um, and nobody knew this. So, th th so that was my first discovery, which was pretty unbelievable. But my second discovery as an investor was even more unbelievable, which was that um, now, Gazprom was trading, remember, at 99.7% discount to Exxon and BP per barrel reserves, because everyone thought that everything had been stolen. And what we discovered was that the reserves that the oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait only represented 9.65% of the total reserves of the company. So 91% roughly was still there. So the market is assuming everything has been stolen and we've just discovered that everything more or less is still there. So when you when you see that kind of dis, uh, disparity between um, perception and reality in a financial market what do you do? Well, to use a highly technical financial term, we backed up the truck. <laughs> and we bought as much gas from as we can get. Now, as, as an investor, that's normally where you stop. You, you, you find something that the world doesn't understand, you, you, you um, analyze it, you, you take your position and you wait for everybody to figure it out. But I, I just couldn't sit around and wait for everyone to figure it out. I wanted them to figure it out a little faster. So we took our dossier and we broke it into seven chapters. And I shared the first chapter with the Financial Times, the second one with the New York Times, the third one with Business Week, fourth one with the Washington Post, etc. And then each of them wrote a story about a different scam or fraud at Gazprom involving these reserves. And as a result of these uh, seven stories, there was a number, the Russian press picked it up, and there were about 50 more stories. As a result of those stories, the um, Russian parliament began debates on whether it was a good thing or a bad thing for the management to be stealing all these assets from Gazprom. <laughs> More stories. Um, uh, <clears throat> at, 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 at this point, then the management um, uh, hired PricewaterhouseCoopers um, to write a report to say it was a good thing to steal these assets. <laughs> More stories. So, on and on and on. By the end, there was about 500 stories written about all the fraud at Gazprom. And then something totally unexpected happened. At the annual general meeting in 2001, after all this back and forth and scandal, um, Vladimir Putin stepped in. He had just become president a year before. He stepped in and he fired the CEO who did all the stealing. And he replaced him with one of his friends whose job it was to not steal any assets at Gazprom. 
I stress, stress the word assets. He could steal other stuff. <laughs> but just the announcement of not stealing assets at Gazprom and the share price jumped the next day 138%. And then the share price doubled again, and then it doubled again, and it doubled again, and it doubled again, and it doubled again, and it doubled again. Between 1999 and 2005, the share price of Gazprom went up 100 times. And this was my largest single investment. Now, you, you can imagine I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> and I thought to myself, this is a pretty good way to make money. And so we did the same thing at the National Electricity Company, at the National Savings Bank, at a couple of different oil companies, at a pipeline company, et cetera. Not every, every one of our campaigns was as elegantly perfect as the Gazprom one, but some of them were equally great. And I went from $100 million of assets uh, to $4.5 billion worth of assets in that time period. I went from, uh, from a, becoming, being almost nobody to becoming the largest foreign investor in the country. Um, and I had the, just the perfect job because not only was I making money for my clients and making money for myself, um, but I was doing, um, I, was, I was doing the, um, uh, I was getting the bad guys and, and there was nothing more exciting than that. So it all just seemed perfect. And, um, and then it all came crashing to an end. And I was flying back to, um, uh, uh, I was, <clears throat> well, I was flying back to London in, in um, uh, 2005. And um, uh, I was stopped at the border. I was um, uh, detained for 15 hours at, um, at the airport. And, um, and then they put me on the next flight out, and I was declared uh, a threat to national security. <clears throat> so I was the largest foreign investor in Russia that wasn't allowed back into the country. And when the Russians turn on you, they tend to do so with extreme prejudice. <clears throat> and I said to myself, um, you know, being kicked out is, is, is a sanction, um, but they could surely do much worse than that. And so I evacuated my entire staff and I sold every last share I had in Russia. We sold four and a half billion dollars worth of stock, and got out, of, got everything out. And it's um, people often ask me, how is it if they turned on you that they um, that you're able to get everybody and everything out? And the and the answer is that um, they're evil over there, but they're very incompetent at, at executing their evil. <laughs> so I got everything out. I thought that was the end of the story. And then, um, but it turns out that it wasn't the end of the story, it was just the beginning of the worst nightmare you could ever imagine. And um, 18 months after I was expelled, um, 18, or 25 police officers raided my office in Moscow, 25 more police officers raided the office of, a, of my American law firm where, we, where they kept all the corporate documents for the companies through which we had invested in Russia, which were empty at this point. <clears throat> um, they raided, the, oh, they raided our offices, and they were, they, were, they were specifically looking for the stamps, the seals, the certificates for our investment holding companies. They found them at the law firm. They seized them. And the next thing we know, we don't own our companies anymore. Using the documents seized by the police, our empty investment holding companies have been transferred away from us. I was very worried about this, not for economic reasons, but if the police were involved in this, God knows what else they would be doing. And so I went out and hired the smartest lawyer I could find, a young man named Sergei Magnitsky, to help me figure this whole thing out. Sergey um, went out and did an investigation, a very thorough investigation, and came back um, about eight months later and said, I figured out what was going on here. It was a two-pronged scam. Uh, the first prong was to steal all of your assets, which they didn't succeed in doing. But the second prong, which they did succeed in doing, was when you were selling all of your assets um, back in, in 2000, um, Six, um, and when you, and when we sold all of our assets, we had a, a, a capital gain of a billion dollars, and we paid two hundred thirty million dollars of capital gains tax. And what Sergey had discovered was that the people who stole our companies, um, they went to the tax authorities, and they applied for a two hundred thirty million dollar tax refund. It was the largest tax refund in Russian history. They applied for it on the twenty third of December two thousand seven, and it was approved and paid out the next day on Christmas Eve. We were 
in shock because this wasn't my money they stole. They stole their own money. And we thought for sure this had to be a rogue operation. Would Putin have allowed uh, his own officials to steal government money? No, that's what we thought. And so we filed criminal complaints all across the, the um, criminal justice system. Um, I went on TV and radio and, and newspapers making a big, big public statement about the whole thing. And then Sergei gave evidence. He, he gave testimony uh, to the Russian State Investigative Committee, which is the FBI of Russia, um, describing the whole thing. And we waited then for the good guys to get the bad guys. Turns out that there were no good guys in Putin's Russia, only bad guys. And um, about a month after Sergei testified, some of the same people he testified against came to his home at 8 in the morning on the 24th of November 2008 and arrested him, uh, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with uh, 14 inmates and eight beds, left lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in, in December in Moscow. He nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just the hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They'd move him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of this was to try to get him to withdraw his testimony against the police officers and to sign a false confession um, saying he stole the um, $230 million. He did so, and they wanted to get him to say he did so at my request. Sergei was, was a simple tax lawyer, um, not, not some kind of... Um, uh, uh, incredible macho man, but when, when you put, when Sergei was put in this situation of, of being asked to perjure himself and bear false witness, he turned into a man of steel, and, and for him, the idea of doing that was just incomprehensible, and he refused under any circumstances to sign this false confession. And so the, so the, the uh, torture got worse and worse and more consistent and more consistent. And after six months of this, he ended up losing 40 pounds developing terrible pains in his stomach, and he di got diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation. Um, the operation was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. A week before the operation, they came to him again, asked him to sign this false confession. Again, he um, refused. And they abruptly moved him out of the prison that had medical facilities to a, a, a maximum security prison in Moscow called Butyrka, which is considered to be one of the toughest prisons in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei, there was no medical facilities there at all. At Butyrka, his health broke down completely. It went into a downward spiral. He went into constant, agonizing, ear-piercing pain, untreated. He and his lawyers desperately wrote um, requests for medical attention to every different branch of the criminal justice system. They wrote 20 different letters. Every one of their letters was either ignored or rejected. And on the night of November 16th, 2009, Sergei went into critical condition. On that night, the authorities of Butyrka didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore. So they put him in an ambulance and sent him to another prison facility that had a medical wing. But when he arrived at this other prison, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him into an isolation cell. They chained him to a bed, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him um, with, with those rubber batons until he died at the age of 37. That was six and a half years ago. He left a wife and two children. <clears throat> I got the news the next morning on the 17th of November, and uh, it was by far the most shocking, traumatic, um, heartbreaking, life-changing news I could have ever gotten. And after getting over the um, initial shock and hysteria of what had happened, I made a vow to his to him, to his memory, to his family, and to myself, that I wasn't going to let these people get away with it, that I was going to use whatever, my, whatever resources I had to uh, get justice for Sergei Magnitsky. And I would have thought that justice would have been obtainable, but it turns out that in Russia, they circled the wagons. They exonerated everybody who had any role in his, in his uh, death. They gave some of them special honors and promotions. And the only two people who have ever been prosecuted in this whole affair was um, Sergei Magnitsky himself, three years after they killed him, they put him on trial in the first ever posthumous trial in the history of Russia. And they put me on trial as his co-defendant. And we found us both guilty, sentenced me to nine years. They couldn't do anything more to him. So we couldn't get justice in Russia. We decided to get justice outside of Russia. And we said to ourselves, what, is, what kind of justice can we get? 
And I came up with this idea, which is that the people who killed him did it for money, and they keep their money in the West. They did it for $230 million. And so I came to Washington um, in 2010, and I met with Senator Benjamin Cardin from Maryland and Senator John McCain from Arizona, and I told them the same story I just shared with you tonight. And I said, why don't we take away their visas and freeze their assets in America and call it the Magnitsky Act? And they said, that's a wonderful idea. And they introduced the Sergei Magnitsky Act in, in October of 2010. We spent two years working it, working it through Congress. On, in November 2012, it went for a vote in the Senate. It passed 92 to 4. It passed 89% of the House of Representatives. And on the 14th of December 2012, President Obama signed it into law. There are now 39 people on the Magnitsky list. 32 of them were directly involved in Sergei's case. Uh, seven of them have involved in other human rights abuses in Russia. This law became the template for when Russia um, invaded Ukraine. There was no argument in Washington about what to do. They immediately used the template of the Magnitsky Law to sanction Russians involved in the invasion of Ukraine. It became such a good idea that, they, they, that the same senators proposed the Global Magnitsky Act, which would punish people all over the world for doing the same thing. Um, it's passed the Senate unanimously. It's now working its way through the House. We'll never be able to bring Sergei Magnitsky back, but his legacy is one where it punishes bad people doing bad things all over the world, and at least he didn't have a meaningless death because of that. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions, and I think there's some. Some. Uh, I'm not sure how this. Uh, are you guys gonna gonna do the um, moderating? Of Don't be shy. I see someone is ready to come forward. I'm from China, so pretty much I understand what you're talking about right now. <laughs> so now China government is promote a policy which is called PPP. It's called the Private Public Partnership. Do you think in the future it's still good business for all the people, or you think it will happen the same in Russia? I, I, I didn't quite understand your question. Is, I see that for Chinese government now, they will promote a policy which is called the Public Private Partnership. It means that they it's similar to Russia for the privatization in the 1980s. So do you think it's a good opportunity for, uh, for business, or you think maybe it will end up as the same as Russia? Um, well, you probably won't like my answer <clears throat> coming from China, um, uh, but, but it seems to me that, that um, uh, in countries where there is no free press and um, not a clear rule of law, it's very hard to make money under any circumstances, or it's very hard to make a predictable return on your investment if arbitrary things can happen and you have no recourse. And so uh, if, if, my, if the question is, w do I think there's a great opportunity to invest in China, um, I, 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 I hope you're not insulted by this, but I wouldn't put a, a penny of my own money in China because if something went wrong, I wouldn't know uh, how, to, how to get recourse in the same way as what, what happened in Russia. Now, of course, people do make money in China, but people also get rounded up and thrown in jail for arbitrary reasons, and so that makes it a, 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 less, a less secure place to invest. Thank you for being here, Mr. Browder. Um, a few months ago, uh, when I read your book, I never thought I would get this opportunity. I want to personally thank you for your heroic act. Uh, I was born and raised in the Republic of Georgia, so the story resonates with me. Uh, my question has uh, to do with um, uh, the fact that um, you're, you're allowed to reach certain levels of success in Russia, and that only after that le those levels, they came, came after you. Can you speak a little bit about that and touch upon that subject? Yes, a good, good question. <clears throat> so uh, th there has always been this qu question, <clears throat> which is among business people. Everybody, everybody goes to Russia, who, or, or the people who go to Russia say to themselves, 
you know, I know that there are, I, I know what happened to you and, and I know what happened to Michael Hordakovsky of UCOS and, you know, so the way that we avoided it, and, and then people have these like strategies for avoiding problems in, in Russia. They say, well, we, we, we go in partnership with so-and-so or as long as you don't go into strategic sectors, then you'll be okay. Or as long as your business isn't too big, it'll be okay. Um, and every one of those excuses basically um, has been disproven by the results of people being um, uh, uh, abused in Russia. And there's only one way you can avoid um, being targeted in Russia, and it's pretty straightforward. If you run a business and you don't make any money, they won't touch you. <laughs> Seriously, if you make money, they'll come after you. And, and you're right, there was a certain level above which they come after you for sure, but that level has been dropping and dropping and dropping. And as they get more organized, and as the government understands where the money is, um, they'll go after everybody. And I don't know a single person that, that's in Russia that doesn't have some type of problem, not, not necessarily as dramatic as my problem, but some type of problem related to the lack of rule of law and to property rights being abused, et cetera. And people ask me, well, what do you think about investing in Russia? Is it, you know, now that the prices have come down, et cetera? And the answer is it's completely, it's an uninvestable place. It's uninvestable um, for financial reasons because of all this stuff, but it's also uninvestable because there's an infinite risk of personal harm to you or to others who are, who are working for you if something goes wrong. And these kind of risks just don't exist in, in other places. And I, and I would go further than just say investing in Russia. I would say taking Russian investors carries a risk. I know people say, well, this Russian money is available to me. And I know people that have taken Russian money and then end up losing it and then they have all sorts of problems that you would never have in another situation. And I'm not anti-Russian, by the way. I'm married to a Russian. Most of my employees are Russian. Um, I'm anti the Putin criminality of Russia right now. Hi, Mr. Browder. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's a huge honor and it's a really incredible story. Um, I don't know if you're still involved with this world, but my question is, if you were to open another Hermitage Capital uh, fund in an um, emerging market today, which country would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> Um, people do ask me that question for, uh, over the years, and, and uh, well, so, so um, I mean, the, the, the real question is, where are the investment opportunities today in the world? And um, <clears throat> we're in a very um, uh, difficult world to invest in right now, uh, because interest rates are zero, so you can't make any money on bonds. Um, uh, credit spreads are extremely low because there's so much money being pumped into the system around the world. Equity valuations are one to two standard deviations away from the mean, um, expensive. Same thing with private equity valuations. And so um, uh, the answer is, and, as re and, and then you have, have all these emerging markets that, that have ended up getting overvalued because of, because of that. Uh, emerging markets have come down in the last year, but I, I don't think anywhere to the level that I'd be interested in investing. And I should point out that I made all my money in emerging markets, and I don't have a penny of my own money in emerging markets right now. And so I'm waiting until there's some kind of, of correction or, or crash before getting enthusiastic about investing in anything. And, and I mean, in a certain way, you guys are great. You're, you're in, in school right now, so you can wait it out. And so hopefully there'll be some kind of great opportunity down the road. But right now, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing anywhere close to what Russia was like um, when I got started uh, in the world. And if anything, everything is, is overvalued. So uh, uh, I can't put my hand on my heart and say, oh, Go, you know, go to Cuba and everything will be great. It's just there, there's, no, there's no place that I'm, I'm aware of that uh, offers outsized returns um, right this second. Thank you so much for being here. I, I hope you don't see this as a very naive question, but what I'm trying to wonder is there's a pithy saying that free markets make free people. And I'm wondering, is there a responsibility for capital markets to invest in places like this, as you said, to change bad behavior and to incentivize good behavior? Well, um, uh, free markets can't exist unless you have, uh, so the way I describe it is that they built a house in Russia without putting in electricity, plumbing, and, and other important infrastructure. So the electricity and plumbing of free markets are laws um, and property rights. And um, you can't have in institutions, you can't have freewheeling capitalism without having mechanisms to prevent people from stealing from each other. and, and um, and dispute resolution mechanisms and institutions to guard people, et cetera. And you just didn't have that in Russia. You don't have that in a lot of places. And so capitalism is terrible if you have that, if you, if you just have that without the rules. And, and, and that's where the whole thing didn't work. 
As not to sound pessimistic, but there will always be evil, and it's been very suggested that there's been increasing corruption. You made a template to suggest against sanctions of bad behavior. Do you think that it's possible, using your knowledge of corruption, that you could create shorting instruments to create a gain? Um, well, I'm coming back to your, to your colleague's question about where the, the opportunities are in the world. Maybe shorting th certain things right now is <laughs> shorting bonds at zero percent interest rates is probably an opportunity. Um, in terms of corruption, so I, I, I had I had created a, a good business model, um, which was you could actually make money from discovering corruption, not not shorting. And the reason why stuff went up when I would expose it was because if you're buying something at one cent on the dollar, and, and because everybody's stealing and then you can stop the stealing, then maybe it can go up to five cents in the dollar and you make five times your money. Um, I mean, I think that there's a, probably a, a, a real opportunity generally in the world, uh, uh, and, and I think a lot of people have, have discovered this with this whole idea of shareholder activism and, and going after bad managements and bad companies. And I'm, I'm actually invested with some, some smart uh, investors who, who um, make a lot of money right now by shorting um, uh, com small small cap companies in Japan that are fraudulent. There's also apparently a lot of fraudulent companies in Japan. And so yes, there's all sorts of interesting things. But um, uh, um, I'm I'm not I'm not uh, I'm in a different stage of my life than you are all. I'm I'm, I'm now uh, fighting for justice, not fighting for money. So um, I'm not going to be creating any more financial products. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for the incredible, extremely interesting story. Um, I apologize for not asking a specifically business-related question, but I think your personal perspective on this would be fantastic. Um, I think there's been, or uh, I seem to have observed, uh, a certain amount of glamorization of Putin as a leader during this election cycle. I was curious about your personal perspective on that and what the potential consequences of that might be, if there are any. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, <clears throat> so Putin is an evil man. Um, he's a bad man. And, um, uh, and, and it is very annoying listening to Donald Trump um, uh, calling him a great leader. Um, but the great thing, so, and, and so, so most people would say, Bill, you must be just hugely annoyed by this whole thing. But the, the answer is that um, uh, Putin and Donald Trump have actually done me a big favor. I've spent the last 10 years trying to tell the world that there's some pretty dangerous evil going on in Russia and you need to pay attention. And most people said, couldn't imagine how it, ha how it had any impact on them whatsoever. And, all the, and so the average American knew, knew nothing about Russia, knew nothing about Putin, other than his guy riding around with his shirt off on a horse. <laughs> but all of a sudden now, the average American thinks of two things about Russia. They cheat in sports, and they hack um, politics. And the average American now, I mean, when I was growing up, they had this show, Rocky and Bullwinkle, and there was these two evil characters in the show, um, uh, Boris and Natasha. And, and, and we're now in a world where, where, the, you know, where the Russians have sort of played into that stereotype again. And from, from, a, from a cultural perspective, it's actually easier for me to tell my story, provided that Trump doesn't become president um, and sort of ha have the first state visit be Putin. Um, it, it could actually help my ability to, to promote the, the issues that I'm trying to work on. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, my question is, if you look at the sale of the century in late 90s Russia, and you now compare that to today with extremely low energy prices, uh, demographics that hurt Russia in the, mid, in the short term and, and middle term future, it seems like there's no place to invest east of, uh, east of Europe. Is, uh, if you were to hypothesize as to where Russia will be in 15 to 25 years from now, what do you think that would look like? Well, I mean, Putin is taking Russia in, in a very harsh, unpleasant direction, which um, uh, uh, I think is going to look like um, Venezuela, um, you know, or Zimbabwe. Yeah, I mean, the, the more, the more, the worse it gets, the more repressive he gets to keep control of the country. And the more repressive he gets, the worse it gets. And um, uh, and they're, they, you know, they're not doing anything to diversify away from energy. They're um, there's, there's, there's no incentive to set up any kind of business there at all, and so it just becomes more and more energy related. And the, the, um, the, the, the worse the economy gets, the more people then pile on and steal from the, the economic entities that do produce money. And so um, I don't have very positive 
prognosis for where it is in 15, 20 years. Having said that, it could all come, it's a very brittle regime that could all come crumbling down very quickly, you know, and, and you can end up with, with some type of reform at some point in the future. But, you know, the mismanagement, you know, all it takes is a few bad guys to really mismanage a country. We've seen this in a lot of African countries and Venezuela and Zimbabwe and so on. So um, I'm afraid that my, my um, prognosis is not good for the, for based on the current set of facts. Thank you so much for being here. Fascinating story and um, insights. I, my question, I think, is more, more about your personal decision making. I think with, within your decision to evacuate all of your capital and your staff, a, as soon as they, or right after they detained you at the airport and then labeled you a threat to national security. To, to me, that is actually really impressive. I think for most people, it would be hard to make that decision so, so abruptly. And so I'm curious about what um, led you to that, and if you think that your first kind of loss um, at 31, losing all of that money, gave you some of that insight, if you think those two are related, or if there were other reasons that led you to make that decision so quickly. Well, it was pretty pretty clear to me that um, I was exposed. I mean, I, I don't think it was such a genius decision, to be honest. Thank you for, for saying that. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, there I was. I, I, I was totally, uh, you know, four and a half billion dollars. You know, I was a complete sitting duck. Um, I needed to, and I knew that, 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 that those are the two places. They could arrest my people or seize my assets. I, I, I uh, and, 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 and I could just picture what it would look like if, if half my assets were seized. You know, it would have just been the most horrific nightmare for my clients and for everybody else. And so, I mean, every, you know, all, all investing is driven by greed and fear. And, um, you know, it's just simple fear that, that um, caused me to do that. Um, and, and I just wanted out as quickly as I possibly could and, and uh, you know, uh, sell first, ask questions later. I don't think that, that I, you, you're nice to say that it was such genius decision making. It wasn't. It was just clear, just, you know, get out, get everything out. I don't want these people to be able to touch me. Hi, uh, my name is Tam Nawapal. I'm also an, I'm from Tbilisi, Georgia. So my question is related to, uh, to what you mentioned briefly uh, about the Ukraine incident and how the U.S. reacted to uh, helping using your template uh, or the uh, Sergei Manichky uh, template for the what happened in Crimea. So I'm curious, before that there was uh, Georgia the war with Georgia, there was 20% of territory still occupied by Russia. I'm curious, what do you think um, the U.S. or any other Western country, uh, whether they have any sort of responsibility or should they be acting more so upon what's going on in Russia and what Russia has been doing in the recent years? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I think you're, you're, I mean, you, you, you're the first victim, um, the first modern victim of, of Putin's aggression, um, and I think that um, if, if, if America, if, if, if this was a George Bush problem, wasn't an Obama problem, if, 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 if George Bush had been more um, uh, aggressive in response to the invasion of Georgia, then we wouldn't have uh, Russia and Ukraine right now. You wouldn't have Russia and Syria right now. Um, and you won't have Russia and all the other places that they're going to be in over the next five years going forward. Russia is is destabilizing the, the region of Europe and, and will destabilize the world. And um, uh, and they're going to do it. Putin's going to do it as a way of staying in power because um, it, you start wars when you're not confident about your power at home. And um, uh, so I think that the West bears a great responsibility towards um, uh, to what happened in Georgia and what happened afterwards. And... and, uh, uh, and it all depends on the next president. I think if Hillary Clinton becomes president, um, uh, she's going to be pretty tough with Russia. Um, if Donald Trump becomes next president, there'll be all sorts of wars um, s sort of spurring up around around the Russia's borders. And particularly with his, um, Donald Trump has said that he doesn't really, he's not convinced that NATO is really all that useful anymore. Um, and for those of you who aren't, you know, pay attention to NATO, NATO is basically the, the um, organization that says that, you know, if you invade you, uh, Estonia, um, America comes to help Estonia to fight off the Russians. And so why wouldn't Russia invade Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania or any of these other places? So pretty worrying. Thank you.